them is one of the unsung moments of his life that we need to remember and we need to celebrate, I think every year, is him putting down the conspiracy at Newburgh. And this was a conspiracy at the end of the revolution where the officers were in, uh, were encamped uh, at the end of the revolution here again at uh, we had already run one at, at a place called Newburgh and in New York and a conspiracy started um, a uh, you know the rumor campaigns and it started to pick up well they basically asked the question look we haven't been paid in years do you think the Congress is going to pay us they're not paying us while we're armed and fighting you think they're going to pay us when we put our arms down and go home and he says, uh, or the, 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 our, our answer was, no, we're not. So we need to take up, take up, take this up ourselves. And it was a, uh, um, it was a moment where the American Republic could have ended, and the idea of civilian control of the military could have ended at that moment. We were in grave peril. Washington understood that. There is a moment like that in Cato in the play, where there is a threat of a. Uh, uh, of a military coup against Cato, and Cato's got to put it down. Washington knew this play inside and out. He had it enacted at Valley Forge, for instance, for his men that winter uh, at Valley Forge. It was very influential. He knew it, and you can read that, that Cato's putting down that conspiracy, read about what Washington does at Newburgh, and see direct parallels. What Washington did there was he called a meeting of all the officers, they met at a place called the Temple at Newburgh. And, um, but he made it unclear whether he was actually going to arrive or not, whether he was going to be there. He, he knew, speaking of his imagination, he was a man of imagination. He was a man of the theater. He was a man of, he knew leadership is about acting. And he knew how to act as a leader, play the role. And so he called the meeting, made it unclear whether he would be there or not, put in charge of the meeting, one of the lead conspirators, Ratio Gates. Uh, so there's Buzz in the room. Another thing he did was he seated some of his officers, their closest to him, throughout the room. The meeting, nobody knows what's happening. The doors open, Washington walks in, strolls to the front of the room. The great Washington, six foot three or so, whatever he was, high taller than all other men, with a grace and a dignity unmatched. This is the greatest man of his age. He walks in, walks to the podium, stands before them. Everyone is awed to silence. He reaches into his coat pocket and he pulls a pair of spectacles out. I always ask my audiences when I'm telling them about this story, I say, How, tell me one of you that have ever seen George Washington in spectacles and glasses. You can't do it. None of his men have ever have either. But he pulls from, in a very dramatic gesture, pulls from, well, he pulls from a note from his pocket first, a piece of paper. He looks at it, he pulls then from his coat pocket a pair of spectacles. And he says, gentlemen, if you will pardon me, if you will forgive me, for I've not only grown gray, but nearly blind in the service of my country. At that moment, the re that rebellion ends. Washington then goes on to read a really uh, a dramatic, sta a shaming statement, shaming those men uh, for what they had planned to do, teaching them a lesson in republicanism, very clear lesson, and about what it is to be a gentleman, about what it is to be an officer. Those men, when he put on those glasses, however, they started to weep. They, before he even read anything, there was weeping in that room. Because Washington, what he had done was he had showed a flaw. He had showed a flaw. He had showed this was not the perfect Washington on horseback, but a man who needed reading glasses, a man who had gone gray. And in his reading, what he had said was, who was not with you? Was I not with you in this battle? Was I not with you in that battle? Did I not sleep with you in this, in this camp? Did I not go through this hardship and that hardship? And it's the exact same thing Cato does to his men um, of the Republican forces uh, fighting uh, for the empire. Now, against the empire. Now, at the end of the day, the growing empire, at the end of the day, uh, Washington, when he dies, one of his last words, his last two words were, he took his own pulse, showing he's in command of himself, I think, at that moment. And then he said, tis well. And that's it. 
At the end of the at the end of the play, Cato, Cato ends up committing suicide because, unlike Washington, his forces were not going to win. The Republic was done, and rather than hand Caesar the propaganda tool of uh, of having him alive and being able to pardon him and and uh, and say, look, uh, here's your great hero, uh, Cato, he committed suicide. But be right before, as he did, he said, "Tis well." Cato is again in control of himself, or is master of himself. So, at the beginning of his life, you see, with the letters having to Sally Fairfax, this play influencing Washington's imagination. You see it at key moments, I've only shared one, and at the end, you see it right at the end of his life again, as a, as, as a key to under, putting his life into context. And it really shows us again that very essential lesson that imagination rules our world, every one of us imagination rules the world of our leaders and we better be very careful about what kind of literature we read what kind of plays we watch what kind of movies we watch what kind of television we watch what kind of books we read what kind of heroes we have and washington should be one of those heroes mm -hmm.